Good morning, church. I hope you're having a great day. I can't wait to dive into God's presence together. I know that today as a church family, he has important things for us. Here we are today gathering online. Next Sunday, the last Sunday of January, we will also be gathering online. And February 7th, the first Sunday of February, we are coming back together for in-person services and online services. And we can't wait to take that step together. I want to encourage you to just continue to be in prayer for our church, for our church family, for our neighborhood, for our city and our nation such important moments and seasons that we are walking into today. And as followers of Jesus, we need his word, we need his presence, and we need his direction. And I believe that is exactly what's gonna happen today. So will you pray with me? And then we are gonna worship together. Father, we love you, we need you, we humble ourselves. And we just say today, God, that we need your voice. We need your health. We need your presence. We need your leadership. And God, we need your gospel. So come and walk with your people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Welcome to church. Life, 
you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able So I'm gonna see the goodness of God Oh, I will see the goodness of God
Jesus, we just thank you that you are always good. God, that you are always good, that you are always faithful. God, that you are kind, that you are merciful, that you are generous with your love towards us. Even when we do not deserve it, God, you lavish us with your grace, with your mercy, and with your kindness. Lord, I ask right now, that just in this time of worship, God, that we would continue to receive your goodness, God, that we'd pour our lives out before you, knowing that you receive all of us, the good, the bad, every part of us. We pour it out before you, Lord. All of our hearts, our minds, our soul, our strength. God, and may we receive a new heart, a softened heart, ears to hear your words, eyes to see your goodness. Would you continue to minister to us today? In Jesus' name, amen. Every week as a part of our worship, we share in a liturgy that adds language to what we mean when we talk about generosity. So if you would, would you follow along on the screen and partake in our giving liturgy? Holy Father, you are a faithful provider. There is nothing I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. To keep everything to myself and to give without sacrifice, to build my kingdom is the way of the world that you cannot abide in. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with freed hearts and serve him with renewed minds who withstand the delusion of riches, whose hearts are in your kingdom and not in the systems of the world. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no need among us. I am determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust me with true riches. Above all, I am determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show you to the world. Today, I want to invite you into one of the most significant moments of King David's life, something that I believe marked him almost more than any other moment as a man after God's own heart and something that we need to discover ourselves, where David declares that he will build a house of the undignified. And if you're taking notes today, that's exactly what we are calling this teaching the house of the undignified. Now, last week, we explored these stories about David's life before he became king. We saw that there are so many different moments that to tell us about his character and his heart and reveal who he was at this moment in his life as a man truly after God's heart. We looked at the story of David and the giant and the invitation to live not out of fear of man, but a fear of God. We looked at the story of David and the priest and the invitation of what it looks like to take ownership for the brokenness of the world that we did not cause. And we see finally the story of David and the king and the birth of the counterculture where David refuses to treat Saul as Saul so willingly treats him and what it means to be a people who trust God with their future. And today we are only going to look at one story, the story of David and the ark. Now, You're going to be familiar with this story for one of two reasons. Now, the first, which I think is most of us and most likely, is that you are profound Old Testament theologians uh, theologians and scholars. You uh, go to bed at night just not waiting, uh, not being able to wait to read uh, 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Chronicles and 1 and 2 Kings, and you've just discovered everything there is to know about the Ark of the Covenant because you are just that in love with the Old Testament. That's the most of us, right? Now there's going to be a few of us who have also learned about the Ark of the Covenant because of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? You remember this moment? It's a good moment. And uh, what I love about this is that actually this movie, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, is uh, is is this incredible like 
symbol and picture and mystery that is that has kind of captured the attention of the world. Of course, the Raiders of the Lost Ark is is this really uh, fun movie that is centered around the discovery of this hidden piece. And you know, here's the truth: the theology of Raiders of of the Lost Ark. It, it, while it might not be perfect, it's not that bad. At the end of the day, the theology is quite simple. It's it's just don't be this guy, <laughs> right? Right? Like if Raiders of the Ark is trying to teach you anything, it's just don't be that guy. And uh, that's not a bad thing to learn from it. I actually, I remember this moment. Uh, I, I loved Raiders of the Lost Ark at, at Disneyland. They have an actual ride of it. It's, it's not at Disney World. I know that uh, my knowledge of Disney World and Disneyland is not uh, making me seem uh, <clears throat> more manly. But there's this ride at Disneyland, and I loved it. And uh, I had the chance. I was speaking in California. I brought my oldest sons with me a few years ago, and I took them to Disneyland for one day. And I could not wait to take them on the, on the uh, Indiana Jones ride. And I was talking it up, and they were so excited. They've never seen any of the movies. They're a little younger. And we get in, we get in the ride. At the very beginning of the ride, the, the, this, you know, it, it's, it's a suddenly this massive idol and its lights start glowing. And my sons immediately bury their heads into my chest and into my body. And for the entire ride are just like, Dad, is it over? Dad, is it over? And I just want to tell you that that was... Uh, that was a moment uh, that is going to cause great pain into their future. And I did not win Father of the Year that year. And uh, I'm just hoping most of their life they will forget that that moment had taken place. But the, but the story, right, that we are entering into is about David and this Ark of the Covenant. And this picture of something that is actually quite significant. The Ark of the Covenant uh, is an ornate gold and wooden chest that God actually asked Moses to build. And here you're going to see a picture of kind of a replica of what it would have looked like. And it was the physical marker of the covenant that God had made with Israel. It was held in the Holy of Holies. It was the only thing in the Holy of Holies. And it was the place that that God's presence permanently dwelled with his people. Inside of it actually were the Ten Commandments, were parts of manna that uh, from the radical provision of God during the Exodus. And in Aaron's staff, Aaron the first priest, his staff that budded under the promises of God. And, and here it was, a, it was a marker co- of, of covenant, that God had made a covenant with his people. And it was a unique covenant. It wasn't just a, a covenant uh, of, of, of friendship or a covenant where one side did one thing and the other did another. It was a covenant of presence that God had promised his presence to his people. And the Ark of the Covenant s- was the representation and the manifestation of that. And here we enter into a moment of David's life connected to the Ark of the Covenant. Let's, let's read this moment. 2 Samuel 6, starting in verse 16, it says this, The Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David. Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael's daughter of Saul came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler of the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. Listen to that last line. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. David brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, and as he does so, he dances before the Lord. And this dance, it provokes Michael. She despises how he holds himself. And in her confrontation of him, he declares that he is not ashamed of this heart he holds for God. And he will not be ashamed how he presents himself before this God. And he will not be ashamed of humbling himself before this God, even if some people view it as humiliation. David declares, my house is an undignified house. My house is a house that's willing to humble itself. 
And friends, I just want to say this to us, that our house will be an undignified house, that our house will be a house that is willing to humble itself. And a people who are after God's heart are undignified in their allegiance to Jesus. We must become a people who are undignified because of our allegiance to Jesus. I think in some ways, this is what Paul is saying as he is introing his heart to the church of Rome with this incredible verse, Romans 1, 16 through 17. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul's saying, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed that I am in desperate need of Jesus. I'm not ashamed that I have to humble myself in front of him. I'm not ashamed that the gospel has the power to save and the power to save for everyone. I'm not ashamed. I will get undignified before my God and I do not care what it makes you think of me. Paul declares the house of the undignified in the name of Jesus. And I want to tell you this. I believe this uniquely matters for us because I think it confronts an idol of Southern culture. Southern culture values dignity. Jesus values devotion. And I'm just here to tell you, if your devotion ever requires you to step into indignity, you will have to choose what culture you really belong to. The culture of man or the culture of God. But I want to tell you this story, it, it's, it's got other elements. It, it's got other invitations. This, this climax that we see where David declares that he will be undignified before God, this moment, it, it came from somewhere. And we have to understand the whole heart of the story if we're going to understand the real meaning of what David declares. Something significant has actually happened in the story of David before this moment. And in 2 Samuel 5, we see what it is, that David is finally made king over Israel. That of all the other stories leading up to this moment, as David is on the run, David is trying to be killed by Saul, David is just trying to survive, David is, is establishing his life, but it is not as king, it is one who is on the run. But in 2 Samuel 5, Saul has died, David becomes king. This is what the scriptures say. All of the tribes came to David at Hebron and said, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past where Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. And all of the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, and the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. And and don't miss that. David, uh, God wants David to be king over Israel because David is a shepherd. And what God is actually saying is, I'm a king who's actually a shepherd, and I want a king who will rule like a shepherd. Why God was drawn to David was because he wanted a king who would lead from the heart of a shepherd because that's who he is. Isn't this what Jesus said? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 20. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of God did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, this is the upside down kingdom of God where shepherds become kings and kings are really shepherds. May we carry that heart. May we become those people. And then David does something really meaningful really important. That his first act as king, he, he becomes king and then he immediately goes back to Jerusalem and he reclaims it from the Jebusites. And he, he, he takes back the city that is now called the city of David, the, the city of Jerusalem. And he, and he establishes where his home will be and he begins to clear the way because his first priority as king is to go get the ark, is to go bring the ark of the covenant back where it belongs. You see, Saul didn't care. 
Saul didn't care at all. In fact, as the story goes, if you go back into the story, you're going to find that about 70 years before this, there's a judge named Eli. And he has sons, and his sons do an incredibly foolish thing. They, they decide outside of counsel and outside of wisdom, outside of direction, that they take the Ark of the Covenant and they bring it into battle. Ultimately, they lose. All of Eli's sons are killed, and the Philistines actually take the Ark of the Covenant into their own land. And they, they put it in the, the, the temple of their god Dagon. And here we see that actually like a, a breakout of plagues and, and just pain comes onto the Philistine people. They realize it is associated that they have taken the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the, in, in the temple of their own god, and out of fear, they realize realize they have to get the Ark of the Covenant out of their land. And so what they do after a few months is they take the Ark of the Covenant and they bring it just over the border into the land of Israel and leave it there. And for 70 years, the Ark of the Covenant sits on the peripheral of Israel. That it stays there. Capture what that really means. Israel not leading from the presence of God in the center, but the presence of God as a side piece. And Saul, over all the years of his reign, did not care to bring the ark back to home, to bring the presence back to the center. This is an invitation for us to be a people where God's presence is at the center. See, this is what made David, David. And this is what makes us a people after God's heart that we realize God's presence isn't a side project. God's presence isn't something that we give a nod to. God's presence is the center that we lead from the presence of God. We lead in full alignment with God. The first king just leaves it there. But this is what David says in verse 1 in chapter 6. He says, David again brought together all of the able young men, around 30,000. He and all the men in Bala and Judah went to go get the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. David's first act as king, after he claimed Jerusalem, was to go and get the ark. Because David saw it as everything. And here's what we have to see. A people after God's own heart trust God's presence over their own power. A people after God's own heart trusts God's presence more than their own power. Saul trusted his might. David trusted God's. And this is why I think this matters for us. Because David knew that he had a future to be lived. And David knew that there were tasks, there were problems that needed to be solved. And David had one conviction. They will not be solved by my efforts. They will be solved when I am in alignment with the presence of God. If I don't go in the presence of God, I cannot bring solution and leadership to the things that God has called me to do. And something I see rising up in our generation, one beautiful, one dangerous, as a heart of a group of people that are looking over the brokenness of the world, over the pain of the world and something is prompting them even a sense of calling in Jesus name I have to give my life to bring solution to bring peace to bring justice to bring love to bring care to bring hope to bring the gospel this sense of an awakening that you and I have been called into the mission in Jesus name to bring transformation to the world such a beautiful thing but I see something deeply dangerous, a generation that while they feel called to bring solution, they think they can do it out of their power and their effort and their belief and their concept and their idea rather than knowing the truth because they will not listen to the lesson of 2 Samuel 6. They think they have the authority. Friends, you don't have the authority. I'm not saying the heart isn't good. The heart is good. The heart is right. Let's go, let's go, let's go. But we have to go in the presence of Jesus, which is in an alignment with Jesus. We go where he goes, we go how he goes, and we go in his name, and we go under submission to all that he taught us. We do not break from him, from his teachings, from his way, from his word, from his life. We go in him. The only way our efforts are going to have power is because like David, we come from the presence. This is what Jesus taught us. Listen, John 15, he says, remain in me, as I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we believe him? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, Jesus is the answer. That is not like a 
a Bible a, a phrase or a high, uh, you know, a Christian bumper sticker or some, some way of just having some passive concept without wanting to step into the needs of the world. It's the truth. The only thing that is going to solve the brokenness of our world, the only thing that's going to solve the brokenness of your life, the only thing that's going to solve the brokenness of your family is Jesus. We go with him or what we will do will be fruitless. And the story moves on. And unfortunately, as the story moves on, what David intends to be a point of celebration breaks into a moment of tragedy. This is the story continuing. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all of their might before the Lord. There were castanets, harps, lyres, trimbles, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came onto the threshing floor of Nakan, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of this irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there before the ark of God. Then David was angry because of the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day. It said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Let me say this. This is a hard passage. This is hard. And I want to share with you what I believe this passage is trying to teach us, but I don't think if we walk through this, we're never going to get to the point where we can receive that this passage is trying to teach us. We have to recognize that when we come into these moments, we, we feel the difficulty of what the scriptures teach us. And we feel the difficulty of what it might possibly mean. But I, I want to invite you, I need, to, I need you to trust me because I believe not only do we have to understand what these passages mean? We have to understand the heart of why we try to get out of them. Friends, we come to the word of God because we believe it has the authority to teach us about God. We don't try to change it or soften it to accommodate ourselves because we think something is right or wrong. Like, like somehow we are trying to force feed God to somehow mirror what we think is right about ourselves. And listen, I wrote this, but you, uh, this, this, you need to hear what, this is, what I'm about to say because I believe this is plaguing all of us. In our secular culture, we have adopted a metamodern philosophy on life, which tells us that experience is the highest truth, and therefore we must curate our own meaning. We then pick and choose from truths that feel good to us, that fit into the story we are telling about ourselves. This is a bad and untrue philosophy. All metamodern deconstruction is the worship of self and believes that we are the true authorities on morality. When we reshape Jesus and the scripture to, to what feels right to us, uh, we, uh, we are not only not faithfully worshiping Jesus. We are worshiping ourselves. Our God is an idol we name Jesus made in our own image. It's not Christianity. It's idolatry with a Messiah complex. We have this way where we have bought into this idea that we are somehow a moral superior to God. And so we tell him what we must, he must be like, tell him who he must like, what he must do, how he must act, who he should and should not give mercy to, why he is in allegiance only to this or to that. And we miss the reality of what God is actually trying to do in us. And here's what you need to know. Jesus will offend you. And if Jesus hasn't offended you, it's probably just because you're not reading him enough. Jesus will offend you. The scriptures will offend you. And you want to know what? That's okay. The scriptures and Jesus himself belong to another kingdom. You and I come from the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God will always offend the kingdom of man. It will always correct the kingdom of man. And we actually have to allow Jesus to have the authority to offend us. He's the only one who's the resurrected Lord of human history. He's the only one who rose from the dead. He has the authority to invite us into what is true and he has the right to bring offense to us. Even Jesus knew this in his teachings. He said, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. We wrestle with this, but I honor that we wrestle with this. But let me remind you of a few things. First, we can always trust the character of Jesus. Jesus has fully revealed to us who God is. Colossians says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. 
the firstborn of all of creation. Hebrews says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. John 14 says anyone who has seen the Father, or anyone who has seen Jesus has seen the Father. We can trust this. You want to know what God's like? God's like Jesus. He loves his enemies. He actually loved his enemies so much that he came himself to open up a door to full union back with him. This is who God is. We, we know what God's character is like. Second, we have to understand this, that the Old Testament isn't always trying to expose to us God's desires, but rather the consequences of sin without God's help. That there is actually purpose to what we see in the pain of the Old Testament is that what is being revealed to us is this is what would happen in life and this is the reality of what took place if God did not intervene with mercy. That the part of the lesson of the Old Testament is that there is a reality to God's holiness and there is a reality to the consequence of sin. And while God wants to honor that holiness because he is that holiness, he does not want us to face the consequence of that sin. That's why he faced the consequence of sin himself. But we have to let the Old Testament teach us what it's actually trying to teach us, that life has consequence, that sin is real, and that you and I, when we do not actually act in alignment with what has happened in the world, when we want to try to just put blinders on and buy into secular philosophies, everything's fine, nothing's really a big deal, oh, his heart was in the right place, that we actually deceive ourselves because we actually deep down want to say, God, you have to be like this. What gives us the authority to tell God what he has to be like? We have to let the Old Testament do what it's trying to do in us, which is painfully, and it is painful, exposed to us the brokenness of sin. And third, I, I want to say that we have a hard time with this because we, we actually just haven't learned the lesson that Uzzah is really trying to teach us. That Uzzah's lesson is you don't get to tell God that you only follow part of him, that you're only going to honor half of him. You see, David gets the ark, but he doesn't honor what God has already spoken to him about the ark. The ark is not, not something small. It is literally the manifestation of his presence. God's presence is in that ark. It's not just a symbol. It's not just a, a token. It's not just a, a picture. It is literally, this is, God has said, my presence will be here. When David is engaging with the, with the Ark of the Covenant, he's engaging with the presence of God itself. And I don't honestly know, I, I, the scriptures don't really teach us whether, whether, whether David knew or he didn't know. I, I actually tend to think that David didn't make this decision out of his own choice. David make, made this decision out of ignorance. And I think we see the potential weight of the brokenness of what happens when spiritual mothers and fathers don't actually pass along the the full story of God. David gets the ark, but he doesn't honor what God has said. And then this heartbreaking thing happens because Uzzah steps out and as the as this cart stumbles, he puts his hand out. Now, if we go into the scriptures, we, we learn a lot of things. Like the, the ark was never meant to be carried like the ark was never meant to be treated like this. When Moses made the ark, God gave him very specific instructions on how it was supposed to be moved because, again, this wasn't just a thing. God has actually said, I'm going I'm I'm, I'm to put my presence in this thing, my, my presence, which is holy, my presence, which is other, my presence, which cannot be treated lightly. It's only ever to be moved by Levites who are descended by Moses himself. They were the only people who could move it. People had to consecrate themselves in a certain way before they could move it. They, they broke every rule. You had, to, you had to put it on poles. It, 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 was, it was meant to be carried in a certain way. And David and his men forget all of this. They abandon all of this. They neglect all of this. And David, whether he understands this or not, or is functioning in Israel, he treats this moment, catch this, this is why this matters. He treats this moment like he is the hero, like he is the one rescuing God. And this is the attitude that ultimately crumbles into heartbreak. Uzzah reach outs to keep the ark from falling and ultimately dies as he touches it. And here's what you have to see. Uzzah's sin was thinking somehow that the dirt was more unclean than his hand was. That Uzzah's sin was thinking that the ark of God would somehow be more dishonored by touching the ground and not by touching him. Because Uzzah didn't understand that it was not he who was rescuing God, 
It was God who needed to rescue him. Friends, I think we do this. I think we miss the point. And we're not willing to receive the incredible calling and challenge of who God really is, of his power and his holiness. Now, we are those who get to come to God in his holiness now through the showering of his grace in Jesus. But that does not change the reality of who he is. A people after God's own heart do not rewrite God's character to satisfy themselves. They don't. And I'm actually afraid that because uh, we have such a generation of people who only want to honor half of Jesus' character, They only want to honor part of the story that they want to include into their own life. What they don't realize is that they will raise a generation of losers who do not know the true story. Uzzah's sin wasn't his. Uzzah's failure wasn't his. It was the inheritance he was left. He wasn't told the whole story. And because he didn't know the whole story, he acted with indignity towards God. And this is what this moment is exposing in us. Eugene Peterson says this, Uzzah is the patron saint of those who uncritically embrace technology without regard to the nature of the holy. Eugene Peterson, obviously, is a a pastor and a theologian who's speaking about this this passage and distinction to the church. And I I actually think there's some really important things to probably note in that. The ark of God was not meant to be carried on a new cart. It was always meant to be carried on the shoulders of worshipers. This is why God thought this mattered. Because he is saying something to us. If he says this doesn't really matter, then ultimately we're not going to understand what actually really matters in life. And what God was trying to say is that the presence of God is always carried on the shoulders of worship. It's always carried on the shoulders of true worshipers. Friends, this is why worship matters in our house. I'm not talking about a certain style of music. I'm not talking about, 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 about a sense of, of exuberance or, 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 or emotionalism or passion, but actually a genuine devotion to God in life that is worship, that expresses itself in undignified love to God when we gather. And I wonder how many churches are relying on a sexy new cart and sexy new programs rather than just being faithful to what God has asked in his presence. God wants to move his presence in cities, but it will always be moved the way he says and not the way we tell him to say it. And we must come with the reverence and honor of the holiness of God. Oswald Chambers says, we slander God by our very eagerness to work for him without knowing him. Oof. May we receive that. David's angry. Doesn't really even say what he's angry about. My guess he's angry at a lot of things. Uh, Angry at the Lord, angry at himself, angry at this moment. He's just angry. And because he gets angry, he becomes afraid. He's suddenly aware this ark was something else, something more, something bigger. There was something about this ark that he didn't fully understand. He's afraid, and he flees back home. He flees back home. And I wonder, guys, don't we can't miss this. I wonder how many of us, out of anger and fear, or hiding from the presence of God. Moments happen, hard moments. And because of these hard moments, we get angry and we get afraid. And out of anger and fear, we abandon God's presence, not realizing that this is what we were made for. I wonder how many of us need to actually learn this next lesson of dropping our anger and our offense, dropping our fear and realizing we were made for the presence of God. Eventually, David realizes he's been home for several months. The place where they had stored it, God's flourishing begins to take place, and he realizes he has to finish what he started. The ark of God must be at the center of the kingdom because it has to be for the entire kingdom. So he goes and he gets the ark and he finishes what he starts. This is what the scriptures say. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Now, this is an important moment because what we actually see is, is that David stops on the symbolism of six, the symbolism of man. And sin before he gets to the seventh step, the, the symbol of what's holy, and he sacrifices. He is now suddenly aware of what the ark really is. 
in who God really is and who he really is. And as he carries the ark between the sixth and the seventh step, he goes, there is something that has to happen between us. <laughs> this is the moment where you realize the gospel is getting preached in the middle of 2 Samuel 6. On the sixth step between man and the seventh step of God, there is a sacrifice that has to take place. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. Here in this picture, what we have to re recognize is that David, who, who would have worn the garments of the king, who would have robed the king, he would have worn only some things that he, he would have worn to mark himself as the king. He takes off all of his kingly robes and he goes down into what would have been the garments and the basic garments of a priest. And the text is kind of unclear about how much he, he clearly wasn't fully naked, but potentially he was pretty uh, exposed and to the point where potentially all of him could have been exposed. But the point here is that he intentionally takes off the robes of the king and puts on the servant robes of a priest. And he begins to dance before the Lord with all of his might. And while he and all of Israel were bringing up the ark with the Lord with the shouts and the sounds of trumpets. And as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him with all of her heart. They brought the ark to the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And when David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord, and David returned home to bless his household. Michael, daughter of Saul, came to him and said, how is the king of Israel has extinguished him, uh, distinguished himself today? Going around half naked in full view of the slave girls and of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. But David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone in your house when he appointed me ruler of the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And we actually realize if you parallel the story in First Chronicles, it gives it more detail that David had done everything now the right way. He had gone back to the word. He had gone back to what God had commanded. And David realizes he finishes, must finish what he starts. And he cannot be king unless he is king from God's presence. And he recognizes that as he undresses himself from his kingly robe, that he, in the presence of God, is not a king, but a servant. His undignified dance is not simply passion, but it is repentance. It is intentional humiliation. He is telling God in this moment, I've learned my lesson. I see the truth. God, I was trying to rescue you. I thought I was the important one in the story. I thought I was the one who was high and holy and mighty and beloved and good and perfect and true. And I realized, God, it's only you. It's only you. I don't need to rescue you. You need to rescue me. So David, he stops and he comes and before the presence of God, before the ark can enter into the city on the sixth step, he stops and says, a sacrifice has to happen. I can't enter into your presence. I'm not worthy to do that. I, I recognize who I am and I recognize who you are and I will honor you this time. And as they take that step and they enter into the city, then he says, I will not be a king in your presence. That's not who I am. I'm not a king in your presence. God, I'm a servant who's just lucky to be here. And David dances and he repents and he puts on display in front of his people. I know who my God is and I know who I am. I know who I am. And he takes this radical posture of humility. Friends of people after God's own heart find dignity in humility and honor the indignity of the gospel. Who am I? Who are we? Can we really rescue God? Can we really rescue humanity? Are we really moral authorities unto ourselves? Do I think we need him. And I think we need him in an undignified way. And see what made David the leader of the house of the undignified was that he recognized there are times when the world needs to see 
that I am a broken man, I am a sinful man, and I do not do anything to earn you. And somehow in your grace and in your mercy, you have come and made yourself known to me. I will not change who you are. I will not be ashamed of who you are. And I will stand faithful in who you are. And I will tell the world the truth that there is a God of love who is so good, who is so right, who is so true, who is so holy, and he's for us. But our sin, our chances, our choices, our moments, they they're real, they're not petty, they have consequence in this brokenness that the world has happened, that's that taken place, has caused a separation between us, a separation that I cannot now take back. And God, it's only you. And David knew it, it's only you who can fill this gap between the sixth and the seventh step. And friends, it is only Jesus who has come to fill that gap. And I come back to the words of Paul. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed that I cannot earn my way between those steps. I am not ashamed to admit you that they're real. I'm not ashamed to admit you that we will face them. I am not ashamed to admit you that there is a reality to what God has decreed and I will not change his name. I will not change his word and I will not change his gospel and I will not change the glorious nature of the scandalous love that God loved me with such a love that he came and died my death. He came and filled in my gap. He came and did the unthinkable. He got undignified for me. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. Jesus loved you so much he got undignified for you. What are we going to do in response? Protect our dignity? Walk around this world like we're moral authorities? Tell everybody that we can rescue them? Or maybe, just maybe it's time that we get undignified before the Lord our God and begin to proclaim the gospel of Jesus which can rescue all can fix all, and can heal all. Because this is what it means to be the house of the indignified. David is preaching the gospel, and he's inviting us into the weight of what it means to really know him and follow him. Let me make one last thought as I close. The scriptures actually tell us that when David and Michael first meet, she loves him. And there's, uh, there's really no way to fully know, and, and anything you kind of respond to about the heart of Michael at the end of the story is, is ultimately you're just trying to do your best to discern and, and, and to take away some aspects of what you believe it's teaching. But I do want to say this, because I think that there is some significance to this. We're going to see this in a couple of weeks, the, the great failure of David's life is that in many ways he chooses to leave the wrong legacy. And even though he is a man after God's own heart, he has a blindness to his own family. And I think Michael's despising of David was wrong. I think Michael's despising of David showed the hardness of her heart. I think Michael's despising of David is, a, is, is something to help us see that this, 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 this person who saw David's humiliation his unkingliness, his radical devotion to God and was offended by it. But can I also offer you this, that maybe Michael despised David because while she saw his radical love for God, she never experienced that kind of love towards her. And in the hardness of her life, of being betrothed to David, of re rescuing him and putting her own life on the line, being then by her father given away to another man and David comes and he, he invites her back in but he never really treats her with that same love and honor that he did in the first moment. Maybe the reason Michael couldn't see what she was supposed to see was because that David never loved her like she deserved to be loved. And do not let go of the parable of what happens when you neglect your own house. Never, never reject the parable of what happens when people can't see your love for God by the way you treat them. Hardness comes and they get blind to what's true. Michael's blindness was not good, but perhaps it was because she was never communicated 
with the love and the value that she should have been. And may we learn that lesson and never be a people who neglect to love people the way we love God. My friends, God is trying to say something to us. He's trying to get us into alignment. He's trying to make us into an undignified house, a house of shepherds, a house of his presence, a house who does not change his name, and a house who is unshaken and unwilling to go the ways of this world. And we will declare that we have an undignified love. Jesus got undignified for us, and we will respond with an undignified love back to him. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. I ask that you move and that you bless our church family. God, I just pray that you would help us. We need you. Lord, would we be a people who are unashamed of your gospel? Would we be a people who come to you and receive from who you are, Lord? And God, we honor you as holy. And we just say thank you that you're kind. Would you move in our lives? Would you teach us your ways? In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen, may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may he turn his countenance to you. And may you know everywhere you go this week, you are loved by Jesus. We'll see you soon.